All right, so again, I'm uh, pediatric emergency medicine as well as regular emergency medicine, Children's Hospital of Georgia, Georgia Regents. I didn't explain myself before, but I did two residencies, pediatrics, University of Miami, Jackson Memorial Hospital. Terrible place, really, really overwhelmed. And then uh, the Milwaukee Regional Medical Center for my emergency medicine. So I did not do the fellowship, but I went the long way and did both of the uh, residencies. Okay. All right, so we're going to talk about bronchiolitis and croup. As we were just talking about, apparently bronchiolitis, especially croup, has kicked up already. A little early in the year for that, but you know, it happens. Definitions, we're going to go through a bunch of things. Here's an x-ray. I'm going to skip through that for the benefit of time here. So bronchiolitis, common disease of the lower respiratory tract of infants resulting from inflammatory obstruction of the small airways. Affects almost all children by the age of two. So most of the kids, it's more of a bad cold or something, but certainly affects everyone. Leading cause of hospitalization in infants under one. Should be saying one of the leading causes. 125,000 admissions per year in the United States. That's probably a little low now. 11 to 15% of the children will see their primary doctor for this as an outpatient. This is an older study, but National Hospital Ambulatory and Medical Care Study rate in the population is 26 per 1,000, 31 per 1,000 ED visits. It occurs, again, first two years of life. And your peak age incidence is six months. And I think what the thing is, is you're seeing them at six months. That's not saying that the kids don't get it, but that's probably the time that either they're getting the most exposure and are able to show the most symptoms. Highest incidence is during the winter and the spring. It is a viral illness. I stress <coughs> that more than 50% of the cases are due to RSV, 300 to $400 million per year for treatment, 5,000 deaths per year from RSV itself. Other causes, parainfluenza, one, two, three, adenovirus, which can go on to bronchiolitis obliterans, rhinovirus, and probably the more popular one, at least currently, is influenza. Bronchiolitis is not bronchitis, okay? I find this to be commonly written as bronchitis, and it's being treated as bronchiolitis. So most of your infants don't have bronchitis, or don't have a true bacterial bronchitis, they have bronchiolitis. That's the better definition for that. So the patients and the parents need to be educated that this is not the same thing. It is not an infection that, that uh, bronchitis is the infection, commonly bacterial and not common in otherwise healthy children. Co-infections, however, do occur. You can have mycoplasma pneumonia and chlamydia trachomitis in up to 10% of the bronchiolitis cases. So usually this is the kid who was sick for a little while and then got really sick all of a sudden three, four days later. That's going to be your truly now co-infection. Pathophysiology, so bronchiolar, bronchiolar obstruction due to edema and mucus accumulation as well as the cellular debris is resistance to the airflow. Therefore, the small thickening, you get decreased ventilation, <coughs> causes a fall in oxygen delivery, and then an increase in carbon dioxide. This is really, really late. This is not where you want to be. Small airways. You know, you give a little bit of edema, it's a really small airway. That's pretty much the short of that. Symptoms, I think everyone has seen this, but the infant begins with mild URI, there's some nasal discharge, sneezing fever. Gradual onset of respiratory distress, there's this paroxysmal coughing and dyspnea associated with it. Examination, what are we gonna see? Tachypnea, air hunger. Possible cyanosis, even in a kid who's really not all that bad off, just because they got just so much junk in them. If you could just squeeze them out, you'd probably be a whole lot better. Nasal flaring, that's pretty uh, <coughs> common, even early on, the, the nose is flaring away. Accessory muscle use, intracostal, <coughs> supraclavicular for the most part. And then the liver and spleen may be palpable, and this is really just secondary to the hyperinflation, so their lungs are pushing everything else down. Fine rhythm. You shouldn't be doing labs. Honestly, most of these kids don't need labs, but if you do, the white count and the differential will be normal. Nasal pharyngeal cultures will be negative or of normal flora. Immunofluorescence studies of the secretions may demonstrate the virus. Now you've spent a lot of money doing that. Viral blood cultures are positive. 
X-ray. Many people will get the X-ray, but you uh, show some hyperinflation and increased bronchial markings. That was actually my first picture. There. So let's go to treatment. Okay, so bronchiolitis in uh, the U.S. Emergency Department, 1992 to 2000. This was in pediatric emergency care. 2005, they were looking at what most doctors do. 53%. So most of us are using beta agonists. Okay, albuterol. 37% were given antibiotics, which didn't work at all. So 37% were getting something for nothing. 13% received systemic corticosteroids. That may actually have an effect, and I'll talk about that in a minute. 46% had a chest x-ray. That's kind of plus or minus, although I can't uh, ding you for that. And 19% were admitted to the hospital. Now, that's, that's really based on the person themselves, on the child. Cold humidifying oxygen to relieve the hypoxemia and reduce insensible losses. So you know how this always goes up and down, you know, we were using the warm humidified oxygen for a really long time and then they went back to cold and now there's a trend now to go back to a warm humidified oxygen, at least for the moment where we recommend further cold humidified oxygen to relieve that hypoxemia and the insensible losses. Bronchodilators, <clears throat> albuterol. Terbutylene would be very hard to find nowadays, but you know that's uh, something that you can remember. But if you're albuterol, 0.03 cc's per kilo per dose, essentially 2.5 for a child under five, five for a child over five. <coughs> Anticholinergics, ipotropium bromide, which is atrovent. Okay, so atrovent is supposed to dry up secretions. If you're going to use atrovent at all, you use that only two doses and no more for 24 hours. That's a Cochrane review that we'll go into later. Steroids, if you're going to use it, this is one of those, you know, if you don't know what's going on, give us some steroids, maybe it'll work. One per kilo. Most Europeans use 0.5 per kilo, so somewhere in that range, you're probably in a decent place. Ribavirin, a synthetic nucleotide that inhibits a variety of viruses. 0.8 milligrams per kilo, teratogenic to healthcare workers, so sometimes you end up with a problem uh, the administration of the Ribavirin. Costs a lot of money. So this is tend to be used, tends to be used for the kids that are very sick that are being admitted to ICU. RSVIG, otherwise known as Respigam, it's a $3,000 course, about, probably more now. Uh, again, really only for the sickest. Cochrane Review. I like the Cochrane Review. If you've never went to their website, this is way drier than anything that uh, Dan McCullum talked to you about. The Cochrane Review is a bunch of people <coughs> around the world who collaborate online and review uh, published studies from around the world. So they look at published studies, fit them into a certain category that they want, take out the ones that didn't fit, and then put out a position statement based on all of those studies. Okay, so it allows you to look at worldwide. Now, remember, worldwide means you're using places that have uh, universal health care, and it may be biased based on the cost effectiveness of it. Okay, so we have to remember that. All right, so eight trials, 394 children, 46% demonstrated improved clinical score with bronchodilators compared to 75% with placebo. So that gives you an odds ratio of 0.29, 95% confidence interval. So fairly effective, not greatly effective, but fairly effective. <clears throat> I tried to highlight the things that were important in these slides just because I need to move fairly quickly here. So here, the, again, uh, bronchial dilator recipients did not show improvement in measures of oxygenation, the rate of hospitalization, duration of the hospitalization. So the re reviewer's conclusion, bronchial dilators produce modest short-term improvement in clinical scores. You know, I work in the emergency department, I'm all about right now, okay? So for me, modest improvement sounds great to me. I'm good with short-term modest improvement, the mom looks at me, everybody's happy, you know. I'm gonna admit you, she's all good with that. They can get, they can get worse later on. <laughs> New England Journal of Medicine, 2003, studied the use of epinephrine in a placebo-controlled multi-center trial in Australia. There was no difference in length of say, vital signs or respiratory uh, effort. So epi um, being in place of the albuterol itself. Okay, pediatric emergency care. 
again, it's a good journal for those of us in pediatric emergency medicine. 2010, seven clinical trials examined and examined, and majority showed benefit in treatment in bronchi bronchiolitis. One showed a decrease in symptom severity with epi. One showed a small advantage of albuterol in the rate of successful discharge from the emergency department. So the short of it is, it looks like the bronchodilator is okay, certainly for us in the emergency department, but you shouldn't look at it as a long-term fix, okay? You have not fixed the outcome, the rate of hospitalization, you just decrease their symptoms within the emergency room, which in my opinion seems like a good idea. <clears throat> is the difference in outcome due to the disease itself or that it affects different individuals differently? The AAP does, does not recommend the routine use of bronchodilators for the treatment of bronchiolitis. Their position is that the bronchodilators are probably working on the children who have underlying asthma and not the general child. And the problem with this, of course, is that many kids who develop bronchiolitis as infants go on to having asthma. So was it the bronchiolitis that caused the asthma, the fact that they have the underlying asthma that was worsened by the bronchiolitis? You know, we're getting into a cycle, how do you determine that? So I still would recommend it, I just give you the, the idea that, you know, the AAP is an all on it. That's the American Academy of Pediatrics. Didn't know that one. Anticholinergic drugs for wheezing children in the age under two. This is again a Cochrane review. The objective of this review is to assess the effects of anticholinergic therapy in the treatment of wheezing infants. So they found six trials involving 321 infants in three different settings, compared beta-2 agonists alone with a combination of the hypotrophium bromide and a beta-2 agonist, was associated with a reduced need for additional treatment. No difference was seen in the treatment response, respiratory rate, or oxygen saturation, uh, improvement in the emergency department. Okay, so we were we found that they got they didn't need as many treatments, but we didn't really see anything in the objective numbers. Okay, no significant difference in the length of hospital stay between hypertrophy and bromide and placebo. So reviewers' conclusion: there is not enough evidence to support the uncritical use of anticholinergic therapy for wheezing infants. So my take on this is, if the, bronchio, if the bronchodilators helped you, so you give the dose of albuterol, and they seem to have a, a, some effect to it, you either have an underlying asthma child, or you have at least a response to therapy, that would be the child that would require the atropine on the subsequent dose, okay? So the next dose would be albuterol atropine, uh, rather, albuterol atropine, the subsequent dose. If your first dose did absolutely nothing, there's no point in adding the atrovent. Okay, you did, you're not affecting it with the albuterol to begin with, the atrovent isn't gonna do it. And again, there's a Cochrane review that shows only two atrovents in 24 hours shows any benefit. After that, you're not doing anything. Ribavarin, effective in reducing the severity of the disease if given early in the treatment <coughs> once proven to be RSV. So if you have the fast RSVs, where you can send it off or even do it in your uh, emergency department, that's the way to do it. Should also be given to milder bronchiolitis proven to be due to RSV in children with chronic lung diseases, cardiac disorders, immunodeficiencies, and premature infants. So typically we use, we, we really care about RSV in a child under three months, okay? Adjust the gestational age under three months. So if they're preemie, and you're still under three months adjusted gestational age, you should be considering RSV and uh, using Ribavarin if they're bad off. Anybody with bad cardiac disease, once you pass three months, three to six months, now you have this question mark. Is it as effective? After six months, don't even bother looking at an RSV. It's not useful for you. You're not gonna be given Ribavarin. RSV IG. So from the Cochrane Review, again, four studies with a total of 2,598 subjects included the main analysis, all randomized into two trials. Two trials were not blinded. Three studies examined RSV hyperimmune globulin and one exam at the monoclonal. I knew this was a little bit more boring because I'm doing the odds, but let's go back to the yellow. 
the numbers needed to prevent one hospitalization and one ICU admission were 17 and 50. That's not very good, okay? So if I give RSV IG to a bunch of kids, I need to get to 17, 17 to prevent one, and 50 to prevent an ICU. That's not the greatest, so you should probably be saving RSV IG for the ICU patients. All right, immunoglobulin for preventing respiratory. RSVIG is effective in preventing RSV hospitalizations and admissions to the intensive care unit, but not in preventing mechanical ventilation. So you didn't really get very far. So to me, this is the person that I would just, I would hold off on my RSVIG for the children that are gonna be in the ICU that have severe deformities. I showed you the picture of the Pierre Rovan where nobody wants to intubate that kid. That would probably be the one that should be saved for this. Steroids. This benefit is very debated. Many decrease the, may decrease the reactive airway response. Several studies, but there's no clear benefit without including wheezing. So this was the hard part of all these studies. They said they tried to look at studies of just bronchiolitis. Well, where are you going to find studies of just bronchiolitis without wheezing? You know, the kid came in because mom heard him wheezing, or he was breathing hard, or something along that line. So. You'd have to go to a daycare and start, you know, testing little kids with runny noses, essentially, which is really not going to happen. So unless we include we wheezing, so the take for me on that is my kids who came into the emergency department were wheezing most of the time. Right? That's the whole reason we were seeing them. If it's just runny nose and all that from an RSV, then you don't need to go this route. But most of the time, we've given our butyrol. That's the person who's going to need to have your steroids. So there's a transient accelerated recovery, okay? So no difference by day six, but by day two, prednisolone, some of them had gotten better. So again, short term, it's an emergency department. Everything for me is now, now, now. I go with the steroids for the short term. <coughs> Inhaled corticosteroids during and after RSV bronchiolitis may decrease subsequent asthma. This is an allergy and immunology. <coughs> Inhaled corticosteroids. They did some group one, group two, seven days, group three. I'm just gonna kinda go to the end of that. This is in the Spanish journal. Uh, same kind of thing, group one, beclomethasone, group two, no intervention, compared three and 12 months later, there was no difference in wheezing episodes, so the take on that is, current evidence that did not support the use of systemic steroids in wheezing children with primary bronchiolitis younger than, than age two. So if you look at it as far as results, the, the results do not back up using the steroids, okay? Long term, you know, your, my seven days, one week, all that kind of stuff. Short term, it does. So I tend to give steroids, this is my own therapy, I do Decadron in the emergency department only one time. 0.6 milligrams per kilo and, and I'm done. I don't need to repeat it. It hasn't been shown to be useful repeating it anyways. So I get 0.6 milligrams per kilo in the emergency department. Comparative efficacy of oral dexamethasone versus oral prednisone. Two doses of dexamethasone, pretty much what I just said. 0.6 milligrams per kilo on day one and two provide similar efficacy with improved compliance than five doses of prednisone. Anytime you can decrease the amount of medicine you got to give the kid, your mom will, the mom, not your mom, but the mom will be very happy. Although it could be your mom. But anyway, the mom will be very happy. Because if you try and give bad tasting medicine to an infant, they just spit it right back at you. Okay? Much better to try and do this as, as least often as we can. This study was done in asthma, but it had no exclusion criteria for bronchiolitis, so that's really the way I go. I have moved on to only using one dose, and there's a, a more recent study associated with that, so I'm just telling you I do the one dose rather than the two doses now. Uh, corticosteroids, dexamethasone versus placebo, no difference in hospitalization rate nor length of stay, repeat hospitalization, return ED visits with clinical score. So the, the long term, you know, checking out the patient, it really didn't show a whole lot long term. So if they're going to be bad and they end up being admitted to the hospital, and that makes sense to me because, you know, the steroids aren't going <coughs> to act that fast, right? Because your steroids are probably going to kick in around six hours from the time you saw them. So 
I'm going to decide to admit that kid well before six hours. So that to me makes sense. Okay? Inhaled corticosteroids, no difference in the clinical score. We talked about that. Duration of oxygen therapy or, dehyd or duration of IV. Okay. Heliox. Most places aren't going to have Heliox. We can, do, we can get it. We're an academic institution. We can get all sorts of crazy things. But Heliox, the density is seven times lighter than air. Four trials of severely ill infants showed improvement in clinical symptom scores. That's great. Leave that for the ICU. Okay, we really shouldn't be doing Heliox. It's not going to. You're not going to have a good uh, ability to get that. You're not going to be used to it. It's better just let them handle that. This I do use. Hypertonic saline. Decrease in clinical score and length of stay. Thins out the airway mucus. Hypertonic saline isn't really difficult to get. Okay. 7% comes free mix if you want to use it. You can use your 3% that you put in with your, uh, with your albuterol. Instead of just doing the albuterol, you just do hypertonic saline. And they do a nebulizer of hypertonic saline. And it works very well. And we're going to show this on croup too. It actually helps a lot in decreasing that, that noise. Okay. So I'm a big fan of, hyper, of uh, hypertonic saline. But I'm going to show you that you know, there's so many studies that prove me wrong. Uh, DNAs is a deoxyribonuclease. It's uh, meant to uh, decrease you know, the rate of intubation. All that. There was no difference in length of stay, clinical score, nor duration of oxygen therapy. You probably aren't going to have this available to you, so it doesn't matter. I don't have it available to me. Other therapy, CPAP. No different than length of stay. Nasal CPAP is a very good bridge instrument for your infants to get them uh, away from the ICU. If you have the ability to do uh, nasal CPAP or even regular CPAP on a, on, a, on a small child, you really should consider that in the short term for a kid who's having a lot of wheezing difficulty. And if, you're ch if you don't have ICU admission for pediatrics in your hospital, this could be your bridge to get them out of the ICU and admitted to general pediatrics. <clears throat> So leukotriene receptor antagonists, four-week treatment, they had significantly more simple three days. After three months, there was no difference from placebo group. So the end result is the leukotrienes didn't do a whole lot for you either. It's kind of depressing. Most of the stuff doesn't you know, help, right? <coughs> Course of prognosis, patient uh, 4872, <coughs> they may have some happiness uh, spells if they're very young. The patient gets Better quickly, the case fatality rate of 1%. <coughs> Go on to apnea. Yeah. I know I'm running through this, but I'm going to get to the crude part. So, who gets most of the bronchiolitis? This is me as a child. <coughs> Boys and Hispanics. It's me. So that would have been the that would have been the person. You know, my my folks are the ones who get most of the bronchiolitis. I'm not really sure why that is. Maybe most Hispanics tend to be a little bit on the poorer side within the United States, live in the worse areas or something like that. Uh, we're more likely to be hospitalized as well. Many infants go on to have reactive airway disease later in life. This is again that thing I said, is it that they bronchiolitis cause them to have asthma or they have asthma and then they get like a two hip theory and it gets onto it, don't know. Croup, I'm gonna go through croup really quick here. <clears throat> Everyone's heard the coughing of croup, I hope. And if you haven't, you just need to download some seal picture or something, you know, where they're coughing away like a seal. It's very distinctive. Most parents come in telling you, my child has croup. He's coughing like that. It's rare, for, actually, for the parents to tell me, you know, he's just got a weird cough. You know, they, even my horse inner city folks understand that it's, you know, a uh, uh, croup. Gives you that horse, barking cough, seal, inspiratory strider. There's maybe some respiratory distress. There's more distress in the parents than there are in the children when the, when the child's coughing like this. Peaks right now, fall and winter, primarily one to six years in age. Incidents, 5 to 100 of, uh, children between the ages of 1 and 2. Again, mostly boys rather than girls. What is it? Mostly viral. Paral influenza, influenza A and B, adenovirus, RSV, rhinovirus, enterovirus. Even measles, although if you see measles, you know, good for you, because that's not shown, we don't see that much anymore. Spasmodic is a viral-associated, possibly allergic reaction. I've seen this becoming more and more common. So the spasmodic is 
Last night he was he was coughing really bad. He sounds like a like a seal, and I don't know. This morning he's back to normal. So it's usually very short, three six hours. Maybe you even see him in that time period. By the time they get to the emergency department, they're back to normal. That's spasmodic croup. That's usually going to be uh, viral and maybe allergic, and usually it resolves just like that. So what is the pathogenesis of the croup? We know it to be the subglottic narrowing due to the inflammation. The cricoid ring allows fixed area for obstruction. There's a one millimeter swelling causes 65% of increase in obstruction in an infant. Okay, that's the Fusson's law. Okay, uh, mucus plugging, ventilation, perfusion, mismatch because you have so much junk in your lungs and therefore you can't ventilate. You're perfusing but you can't ventilate. Negative intrapleural pressure may lead to varying degrees of pulmonary edema. There could be air hunger. It's funny that you can have anxiety and lethargy at the same time, but essentially you start anxiety and then you move on to lethargy once you get started. So they typically report that the child had uh, a little cold beforehand, maybe within the day, but you know, honestly, the kid with the runny nose, that's like normal, that's like a puppy, right? The, the child always has a runny nose. So if you ask the mom, did he have a runny nose lately? It's almost 100%. Barking, cough, strider, typical course is only three to five days. When to worry? You really only need to worry when you got these two in the main ones, drooling and dysphagia. Because now it's not likely to be croup. You've moved on to a secondary infection, right? Epiglottitis, something really, really bad. Toxic appearance. Most of these kids with croup, they're not really toxic. They cough funny, but they're sitting there playing and, you know, drawing on you with the crayons and all that, they're not, they're not going to be all that bad off. The mom, however, is really worried because that noise is terrible. Strider without cough, uh, without cough or without fever, <clears throat> incomplete immunizations. You know, if they don't have their immunizations, this is becoming a trend now. I'm sure you have this problem here, but we certainly have it in our more affluent areas of the Augusta area. They're not doing the immunizations and therefore are much higher risk for the tracheitis and the epiglottitis. So badness, mimicking the crew. Epiglottitis, dysphagia, odinophagia, drooling, tripoding, which is the sword swallowing thing where you go up like that. Uh, uh, this is the one you need to activate your epiglottitis pathway if you have it. You need to call the anesthesia. You just need to do nothing for the kid but blow some oxygen by them. Bacterial tracheitis, more common in the older children of the teens. This is diphtheria, which is very rare. Staph aureus, you get the same kind of thing. Worsening over hours. Difficult to distinguish from epiglottitis, but the, the treatment is the, same, is the same. You gotta give them to the OR. Super infections uh, of croup. They, usually this is the kid who was actually doing pretty well, was a happy crouper, and now it's suddenly gotten much, much worse. Peritonsula abscess. Fever, odinophagia, prodrome of the sore throat can change you. They'll be re very resistant to the neck movement. The croupers aren't resistant to neck movement. They're sitting there coloring, you know, whereas the, the child with all the other ones that we've talked about is not doing that. They're looking up. They're trying not to move their neck. Neoplasms, foreign bodies. Foreign bodies should be obvious to you, mainly because they don't have anything going on, and all of a sudden now they've got some sort of weird noise going on and then trauma. Don't forget your foreign body because this is actually fairly common. <clears throat> and if you have a foreign body in one orifice, you need to look at all the other orifices, okay? One ear, you need to look at the nose, the ear, everywhere else. Okay, so quick radiographic, remember the steeple sign. One up like that. Okay, how do we treat croup? Cool mist humidifiers, for the most part, there's no literature to support this efficacy, but we use this a lot. Tents don't exist anymore. Um, if, it, if you're old enough to remember the tents, the whole point of put, not putting them in a tent was the baby was getting too cold. You know, you walk in and the baby's blue, shivering inside of the you know, tent, but it's terrible. But we don't use tents anymore, we use the cool mist humidifiers. Racemic epi, if they're bad enough, you can give them a dose of racemic epi. It's demonstrated to reduce the croup score by 30 minutes. Usually it lasts only two hours though, so you haven't really you know, treated much of anything. Corticosteroids, improve the uh, croup score at six and 12 hours. Again, I use Decadron, 0.6 milligrams per kilo. Uh, 
Uh, okay. ER patients sent home, there was no statistical difference in later interventions. This is another one of those, it, you know, you didn't change the long term, but you certainly changed the short term. Everybody was happy, that's what you want. Uh, okay, both treatments, no significant improves. Okay, again, the dosing, 0.6 milligrams per kilo, IM or PO, equally effective. I tend to use PO because it's much easier. Uh, okay. And Heliox at the end. We talked about Heliox earlier. I, 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 most of us aren't just, we're just not going to have access to this thing. There's lack of evidence to establish the effect of Heliox in inhalation and treatment of proof of children. There's all my sources. Good. Done. If you have questions, I know I ran right on to the time, so if you have questions, you can grab me. <laughs>